Good afternoon. A Russian military plane with 92 people on board, including members of the world-famous Alexandrov Army Choir, has crashed into the Black Sea. The aircraft came down minutes after taking off from the town of Sochi on its way to Russia's airbase in Syria. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has declared a national day of mourning for the victims. Here's Diana Magne. Searching the glassy waters of the Black Sea, this is not a rescue but a recovery operation. Somewhere down below, the Tupolev 154 military transport plane, which had 92 people on board, lost off the radars shortly after a refueling stop near the resort town of Sochi, with no survivors, Russia's defense ministry says. Soon after takeoff, at 5.27 in the morning, a Russian defense ministry plane disappeared from radars. There were eight crew members and 84 passengers on board. They were Russian Defence Ministry servicemen and also artists from the Alexandrov Ensemble who were flying to congratulate Russian Air Force pilots in Syria for the new year. There are also nine people from Russian media. And what a loss this is. En route to Russia's Khamemim Air Base in Syria were 64 singers from the Alexandrov Military Choir, including the conductor Valery Kalikov. Almost the entire singing contingent from a song and dance troupe who were the minstrels of the Soviet era, famous in Russia and beyond. Also on board, a well-known philanthropist, Elisaveta Glinka, or Dr. Lisa, celebrated in Russia for her charity work in Ukraine and Syria. A black day for Russia, another one. Flowers still fresh in memory of Moscow's man in Turkey, assassinated last Monday, now the troops sent to cheer Russian forces at New Year and celebrate their year in Syria lost in an instant. I want to express my deepest condolences to families of our citizens who died on a plane crash in the Black Sea today. The administration was ordered to create a committee headed by the Minister of Transport. There will be a detailed investigation of the cause of the crash and we will do everything to support the families of the dead. The focus of that investigation seemingly more on technical error than malicious intent. Russia's president has declared Monday a day of national mourning. Now, the Queen has missed the royal family's annual Christmas Day church service at Sandringham this morning for the first time in decades after Buckingham Palace said that she was recovering from a heavy cold. The Queen and Prince Philip were forced to delay their trip to the estate by a day after they both became ill. Here's Jane Deeth. The royal family went to church at Sandringham this morning without the Queen. She hasn't missed the Christmas Day service for almost 30 years. But after delaying her trip to her Norfolk estate because of a heavy cold, the Queen stayed indoors to recover, although she is joining in the celebrations, according to Buckingham Palace. The Queen's speech was recorded before she became ill, and later she'll talk on the theme of inspiration. She'll celebrate ordinary people doing extraordinary things, like volunteers, carers and just good neighbours who perform thousands of acts of kindness. After a tumultuous year, the Queen will encourage people to take a deep breath to find courage or strength. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, used a Christmas Day service to talk about an unpredictable world, saying the power of God can chase away the fear of terror. He also said families are struggling because society has the wrong priorities. Our values are in the wrong place. I learned last week of a family in one of our cities who lowered their child in a supermarket dustbin to scavenge for food but, but before fishing him out. What will that family eat today? In St Peter's Square in Rome, Pope Francis gave his noon blessing and called on world leaders to end war in Syria and around the world. Today this message goes out to the ends of the earth, to reach all peoples especially those scarred by war and harsh conflicts that seem stronger than the yearning for peace. Too much blood has been spilled, he said. It's time for weapons to be still forever. In Cervinia, in Italy, 153 skiers have spent their Christmas Eve trapped in two cable cars dangling 30 metres above the slopes. The cables carrying the cars had become tangled in high winds and it took a hundred rescuers seven hours to lower everyone to safety. 
Thousands of people in the Philippines are fleeing their homes as the powerful typhoon Nina slams into its easternmost islands. There are warnings of two and a half meter waves along the coast of the Luzon Peninsula, with winds gushing up to 150 miles per hour. Authorities in, German, in the German city of Augsburg have evacuated more than 54,000 people from their homes, while a giant 1.8-ton RAF bomb from World War II is diffused. The city's medieval cathedral has been sealed off and schools are being used as temporary shelters. It is the country's biggest evacuation for an unexploded bomb since 1945. At least two people have been killed and more than 15 injured after they returned to their bombed-out homes in Aleppo. It's thought that the blast was caused by an unexploded bomb. Both Russia and Syria have been cleaning up explosives from the eastern part of the city after declaring a terrorist free on Thursday. They're out of Aleppo, but thousands of Syrian families whose homes have been destroyed are now having to cope with freezing temperatures as the bitter winter sets in. The desire to help, in a very practical way, has turned one charity initiative into a global campaign, as Felicity Spector now reports. Cook for Syria brought leading chefs and food writers across the UK, together with Syrian cooks and social media stars, raising more than £150,000 in just a few weeks, with plans to roll out across the world. Those who've lent their time and expertise, like North London restaurant The Good Egg, which raised thousands of pounds with a weekend brunch event, say they're overwhelmed by the goodwill that's made it such a success. So that was, it kind of snowballed and everyone, you know, everyone got involved and kind of made, made that focus, sharing food and different, you know, different events where people are sharing, sharing plates rather than having their own thing. I think it was, yeah, it's all kind of gone hand in hand. And, and it helps, doesn't it, that Syrian food is so delicious. Oh, it's yeah. so oh, yeah. easy uh, and delicious. <laughs> The cookbook is designed to showcase a far more positive side of Syria's rich history and culture, all part of bringing communities together. Cooking is one of those things that it's about giving. You know, you're feeding people, you're nourishing people, you're making them happy, you're showing them that you love them. Profits will go to UNICEF's Next Gen initiative for children in Syria. The money from Cook for Syria will also go towards winter blankets, winter kits for children, so that can be boots and scarves, and heating up sheltered areas so that children can stay warm and dry and safe over the winter period. Yeah. <laughs> and thanks to the power of social media, the campaign now has a reach way beyond its original concept. And it's going to be, you know, hashtag cook for Syria globally, which is an incredible thing. And I know that we've just been speaking about it. We're not going to just stop here with one thing and anything we can do to support by food and through sharing recipes, that's, that's something that we can all easily do. It's also inspired a deep appreciation for Syrian cuisine, a part of the country's heritage which deserves to be celebrated. Yum. We're back tomorrow at 10 to 7. Until then, have a very, very happy Christmas. Thanks for watching.